On today's show, it's all about survival of the fittest. And I'm not talking about you and me, but the wild critters that brave the cold temperatures. How do they do it? The answer may surprise you. It's the most coveted game fish in Minnesota. And once you find them, they'll never disappoint. Well, most of the time. <laughs> Next, want to try snowshoeing but don't have an idea of where to start? Here we go. No fear. Laura Shera has the ins and outs of getting started snowshoeing. And we take a look at some of Mother Nature's best moments, sunrises. Whether overlooking a Minnesota lake or the prairies, everyone is special in its own way, all about sunrises. Those stories and more, next. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. You know when you hear about wind chills and sub-zero temperatures in Minnesota, don't you wonder how the wild critters survive? Well I did too. I was surprised what I discovered. Mild or severe, we Minnesotans know winter. At one point today, the Twin Cities was among the top 10 coldest places in the world. It'll give you the shivers, goosebumps, even bundle up. Oh my. We add hats, coats, and boots to survive. So here's a question out of the cold. Just how do those dainty birds like chickadees survive sub-zero temperatures 24-7? Or for that matter, fellow mammals like deer or squirrels? Hey, this thing called survival is no game in nature, it's a rule. Make a mistake and you're out as in dead. And it happens. Winter is nature's bottleneck. Only the strong survive. Can a tiny chickadee be strong? Well, yes. On cold winter nights, chickadees can reduce their metabolism to keep fat reserves. But don't those skinny featherless legs freeze? Toes get numb like ours? Not likely. A bird's legs and toes have few blood vessels or nerve endings. However, a chickadee must eat every day or it can be lights out. On the other hand, wild turkeys can go for two weeks or more without eating if need be. Minnesota's deer are well suited for winter. They have learned to gather under evergreens such as cedar swamps to soak up infrared radiation. Cold feet also isn't a problem walking on those bloodless hooves. During severe cold snaps, a deer will also move less and reduce its metabolism to conserve energy. We all know bears hibernate. Well, squirrels have it both ways. On nice winter days, they're out and about. On cold days, squirrels sleep until the temperatures improve. Of all the wild creatures, fish may have it the easiest. Being cold-blooded animals, a fish is always comfortable under the ice. I guess the moral of the story is we need not feel sorry for the wild creatures that spend winter with us. They are simply playing the Earth's oldest game, survival of the fittest. Yet some animals play survival of the smartest. Our Minnesota loons spend the winter lollygagging in the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico, hanging out by a sunny beach, no doubt. If we were smart, we'd be there with them. There he is. Coming up. For the anglers who want to catch bull bluegills, the catch itself is equal only to the adventure to find them. Coming up. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota's select GMC dealers. Rapala Ice Force. Border View Lodge. And by Star Bank. Welcome back. 
One of the best kept fishing secrets in Minnesota is where do you catch giant bluegills? Well, Travis Frank found a lake, and guess what? It's a secret. Somewhere deep in northern Minnesota's forest, Brad Hawthorne prepares for a secret mission. Yeah, this is like that, that <laughs> over the river and through the woods, literally type deal yeah. to get back to where we need to go. Come on. Come on, baby. That's if Ooh. we can get there. 18 below. Do we need to say a prayer over the four-wheeler? It wouldn't hurt. A few guide tricks, and we're in business. Oh, yeah. That's a good sign. <laughs> oh, oh, it's alive! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We have bluegills to catch. Bluegills are the reason we have come. But not just any bluegill. We are looking for Minnesota's biggest. Brad chases these fish year round, and he knows that to catch one today means we must fish down the path less traveled. It's the chase, it's the hunt, it's the preservation of that. Kind of like a treasure chest, always trying to find that new lake with that big bluegill. One pound bluegills still swim here, or so we hope. If they do, it's only because they haven't been taken yet. They're rare. Exactly why Brad fishes here in secret. We're in paradise. We are in paradise. <laughs> Once upon a time, Minnesota had thousands of lakes just like this. But large bluegills became a tasty prize, filling stringers and buckets faster than they could replenish. Biologists say anglers are to blame. There's an overharvest problem on bluegills. It's natural for anglers to select for the largest fish. You know, it's a meat fishery for consumption, so they're looking for bigger fillets. To clarify, a big bluegill measures 10 inches, weighing close to one pound. So as your 10 inch bluegills get depleted, they start uh, dropping their standards down to nines and eights, progressively less. As those big males are gone, the younger males start to mature earlier and they put a lot more of their energy into reproduction rather than growth. And then they you fill the void that was previously filled with big fish. There he is. Bluegill, I came a long way for you. Where there's little ones, there's big ones. Is he on it? Don't think this one's our target species. Oh, it is a little teeny bluegill. Right flavor. Once they get depleted to the point where your fish are maxing out at seven and a half inches, we haven't really shown where you can recover from that yet, and that may take a long time, if at all. Precisely why Brad keeps a tight lip. So these areas right here need to be protected better, and I don't think the DNR can do any better of a job. I think people need to really, once they get to a certain size, they need to go back. Hey, Brad. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Sunfish and crappie were considered, I believe, a never-ending resource. If you wanted a meal of fish, you brought your five-gallon bucket and your rod and you filled it. And unfortunately, it was with 10 and 11-inch bluegill. Today, a 10-inch bluegill is rare, even here in the middle of nowhere. You have to search longer and search harder for these lakes. And all that effort makes success that much sweeter. There he is. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them here. It's happening. That's a good one. If you put the effort in in the winter, the time, the research, and the pure man hours, you will usually be rewarded with either knowing that lake is not worth it and going to the next one, or rewarded with a lake that could give you bluegill treasures for years to come. <laughs> if you keep your mouth kind of closed a little bit. <laughs> yes. Look at the size of that bluegill. <laughs> that is a paper plate right there. Yes. <laughs> and here's my favorite part right here. That, my friend, is a nice bluegill. <laughs> That's awesome right there. It means put it back. 
it really does. I mean, a palm bluegill to me means put it back. Thank you, buddy. In doing so, we hope our grandkids will one day say thanks. There's an art to snowshoeing, believe it or not, and once you learn the tricks of the trade, you'll be hooked. Closed captioning from Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Lake of the Woods Tourism. Now, if you're looking for a new winter activity, Here's a suggestion, maybe snowshoeing, huh? Well, daughter Laura decided to find out how to do it. Snowshoeing. In the past, snowshoes made of wood and rawhide were essential tools for fur traders, trappers, and anyone whose living depended on the ability to get around deep areas of snowfall. Today, snowshoes are mainly used for recreation and just enjoying some winter fun in the snow. But how do you get started? The folks at L.L. Bean are here to help us out. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Laura, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. I am looking to get outside and get some exercise, and I heard that snowshoeing is the perfect way to do that, but I'm not quite sure how to get started. Is there some suggestions you can give me? Absolutely, yeah, you've come to the right place. We have a lot of different kinds of snowshoes at L.L. Bean. You know, really, to start, where do you plan on snowshoeing at? Well, to get started, I'll probably stay local, so I'm not planning on hitting the mountains anytime soon, but of course, it's Minnesota, so I'm guessing I might hit some deep snow. You're gonna need three things to get started snowshoeing. You need snowshoes, poles, and some nice winter boots. So let me first show you the winter walkers. These are our most popular model. This is a real nice introductory snowshoe. There's some basic parts to it. You have the deck, the binding, the frame, and the crampons, which are gonna keep you from slipping. Um, you basically just tuck the front of your boot in there, into the front of the binding, tighten up the rear part of the binding, and then clasp over the top. Tighten everything up and you have a nice secure fit. The third thing you need is a nice pair of snowshoeing poles. This is our winter walker model. This is a telescoping pole, which basically means that a user can adjust it to any height they want. Okay, Anthony, now if I really fall in love with snowshoeing and want to hit the mountains, can I still use my winter walkers or do I need a different type of snowshoe? The Pathfinder snowshoe is made exclusively for L.L. Bean by the Tubbs Company. It has a different binding, the frame is a little bit wider, and it also has different crampon orientation and position on the deck of the snowshoe. We also have the MSR Revo snowshoe, which is an ultra lightweight snowshoe, and this comes in a men's and women's model as well. Very lightweight, as you can see, different features, different crampons, uh, traction on the sides as well as in the middle, and this is good for different ice and snow conditions as well. So I have my snowshoes, boots, and poles, but I also understand L.L. Bean gives lessons? We do at L.L. Bean. Uh, we not only like to sell gear to people, but we like to show them how to use it. So we have clinics on every Tuesday and Thursday on uh, topics like snowshoeing basics and local places to snowshoe. And we also offer discovery courses on snowshoeing every Saturday and Sunday all winter long. That sounds like a ton of fun. Can I come along? Yeah, sure. Let's go. All right. Okay, I just left the store and I have my snowshoes, my walking poles, and most importantly, I have Siri here from L.L. Bean's Outdoor Discovery Schools to show me how to use these. Well, welcome, Laura. It's really easy to snowshoe. We'll just put our snowshoes on and then we'll go over some basics. Ready. All right, Siri, am I all good here? Now your feet are twice the size that they normally would be. So make sure when you're walking that your feet are nice and far apart. Um, and we've added these poles so we can test out the snow and see how it is. So just make sure like you're walking, you're just swinging opposite foot with your opposite arm. Pretty much just go ahead and walk. Go ahead and walk. All right, here we go. This is such great exercise too. It really is actually. You'll find that as you do it more and more. You're looking for an easy way to get outside and enjoy the winter months. Snowshoeing just may be your ticket, but most important, just get outside.
time to sit back, relax, and reflect. How about a perfect sunrise? It may be the best way to start your day. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Connecticut. Tracker Boats. And by Totem Resorts. One of the joys of rising early in the morning, maybe deer hunting, for sure turkey hunting, or fishing, is the chance to see a sunrise. Many times it's a magical moment. This is nature's version of the greatest show on earth. A sunrise. Everybody in the world gets one every day. And almost always, the sunrise makes us think. Duluth writer Sam Cook. It's full of possibility and potential, and you're ready for whatever the day is going to throw at you. Famed hunter Ted Nugent. It's all about the spirit. Somebody's got to tell these kids that getting up this early and dragging your lazy ass out of bed really has its rewards. Author Pat McManus wrote that the best thing about sunrises is that they are free, free and powerful. The sun coming up every day is a story, author Terry Pratchett wrote. Everything's got a story in it. No two stories are alike, of course, and no two sunrises ever seem to be identical. An African dawn is certainly different, Nothing like greeting the day with a giraffe. When day breaks over a Saskatchewan prairie in autumn, a symphony of birds makes for a living sky. Yet all sunrises, no matter where, seem to shed light about life itself. For author Jim Rowan, a sunrise was a lesson in time. Time is more valuable than money, he said. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. When you're up before sunrise and you're waiting for the sun to rise on a deer stand or forever, it's, you realize what a long process it is. It reminds you of how slowly nature does most of what it does. Most of us watch the break of dawn and bask in its silence. Moving moments in our lives find us all without words, Marcel Marceau once said. Marcel was a mime. To Mother Teresa, a sunrise was a message from God. God is a friend of silence, she said. See how in nature, trees, flowers, grass grow in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. Oh, not everybody loves sunrises. Some folks have no interest. Author Clifton Webb wrote that he hated dawns. Why? Well, he said the grass always looks like it's been left out all night. It's been said you can't sneak a sunrise past a rooster, so live the moment. When tomorrow comes, they say, this day will be gone forever, and in its place will be something you've left behind. Let it be something good. Let us begin with, good morning. Ah yes, yeah, sunrises. And you know what? Sunsets aren't so bad either in places like North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, the Wild West. Well, that about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Show them a sunrise. I'm Ron Sharon, of course, always the star of the show, who's seen a few sunrises herself. Is Raven. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. is. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. For more information on these stories and more, catch us on the web at mnbound.com. 
Share your stories on the Minnesota Bound Facebook page under the Share Your Story tab.